on this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. The big advantage that faith-based filmmakers have is they've already got the way forward ingrained into them. And the way forward for any creative of any kind is to find a niche that you already exist in and truly understand and build a community around yourself within that niche. You can then use that community to help spread of wo- spread word of mouth about your work outside of that core community. Not with them being the end goal, it's them to be the starting place. You're listening to the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast, where we call faith-based filmmakers to cinematic excellence, bold storytelling, and sound theology. If we believe that we have the greatest stories to tell, we need to deliver on that conviction. I'm writer, director, and animator, and your host, Todd Schaefer. My guest in this episode is Ben Yenny, the founder and CEO of Gorilla Rep Media, which is a consulting firm for media producers helping them with business planning, financing, distribution, and marketing. The mission of Gorilla Rep Media is to help filmmakers build more sustainable companies from their projects. I've invited Ben to this podcast to talk about the changes we're experiencing in the film marketplace and to speak directly to the needs of faith-based filmmakers. But whether you're in the faith-based arena or not, Ben offers a lot of valuable insight to independent filmmakers. Ben is a widely sought-after speaker and has authored the book on the American film market called The Gorilla Rep, American Film Market Distribution Success on No Budget. He's also written a new book called The Entrepreneurial Producer, 21 Articles on Growing Your Filmmaking Career. This is episode 33. Ben Yenny, welcome to the podcast. Uh, It's great to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so you are quite an interesting person because you've, you've, you came from what I understand, you came into, uh, filmmaking, wanting to be a director, writer, and then you ended up producing, uh, you did some stuff for finance. You, you, you're really into distribution finance and marketing, and you've got your own guerrilla rep media company now that you're working for and some other things. Why don't you just give us a little bit of information about who you are? Yeah, thanks. Um, it did. Uh, you hit the broad points. Uh, I went to film school thinking I wanted to be a writer director. Um, realized pretty early on that I was a much better producer than most of my contemporaries were. So I respecialized <laughs> so that I could get on bigger projects. Mm-hmm. And after I left film school, I started going to the American film market. Um, and after a few years of doing that, I realized, hey. I'm an even better in uh, distribution and marketing and uh, a bit of finance, like the main jobs of a producer's rep. And I uh, re-specialized even further there. Um, The reason I got good at finance was actually I organized a lot of seminars for the institutional, the Institute for international film finance and uh as a result i got to listen to dozens of experts in the field on a monthly basis while i was moderating uh moderating panels so i really got to learn a lot and because of that i got a lot of really specialized knowledge um once i re-specialized as a producer's rep i wrote the first book on film markets um that was actually at a uh, at the behest of a mentor of mine who has since passed, um, and that was where my career really took off. Great, and and where did that lead you to? Um, after writing the first book on film markets, I was able to really expand my mm-hmm. consulting business and my representation business, and since then I've repped. Probably a bit north of 20 films uh, as a producer's rep and executive producer. And I've got another probably seven or eight that should come out this year. Oh, great. And I'm working uh, more extensively in development than I have in the past because a couple opportunities presented themselves to me. And, and most of these films that you're working on, they're, they're independent films? 
Well, it depends on how you define it, actually. Uh, on the representation side, yes, all of them are, because if they were made by a studio, they would have taken distribution rights as part of the upfront deal, and there'd be no okay. room for me in a deal like that. Um, and most of them are very low budget. There are some exceptions that are at or slightly over about a million dollars, but most of them are mm. ultra low budget. So, so what is it that you provide these, these filmmakers when they come to you? Uh, they're looking for what? Depends what stage the film is at. Normally, when I'm acting as a producer's rep, I connect them to a distributor or more recently I've been helping them distribute the films themselves on something of a hybrid model because I have had enough negative experiences with uh, U.S. based distributors and sales agents that I realized, hey, I might be able to do this better. Um, and that's how uh, that arm of business was started for me. Um, so you connect them with um, not only the ability to do self distribution, but you find other, uh, what, aggregators or um, uh, platforms to, to, to sell their films to? On that, it's more that I act as distributor, but I say it's a hybrid model because I actually want input and marketing help from filmmakers because if I try to do it myself, I'd spend so much money that the filmmakers would never make any, and that's not the goal. So I tend to work directly with filmmakers to help get their films out there via a mix of different models that I've learned um, both through time hosting seminars and just time in the field and using whichever tool to make the most sense for that given project. So those models are, are rapidly changing, right? Yes. The industry as a whole is rapidly changing. The tools that you need to grow your profile and grow the profile of the film are largely the same, although mm. they've been tweaked mm. in how you use them and where they're most advantageous to use oh, okay. has been tweaked. So let's say 10 years ago, how much different is it now? And um, what are the positives and the negatives to what you're seeing now? Um, 10 years ago would have been 20... 10, uh, so we were just post-recession in 2010, and that was really as the film markets were mm. still pretty decimated and uh, not great after the two th the crash of 2008. Um, and they still haven't fully recovered. And after this, um, it, these issues with global financial markets resulting from COVID-19 and many other factors, um, it's likely that they'll take an even bigger hit and be even worse than they were in 2009, which was about the bottom. Um, hmm. the, uh, okay. But the big thing you have to keep in mind is that the entertainment industry is pretty resilient, especially when yeah. there are when people are stuck at home watching things and uh, when, yeah. and it is still one of the cheapest ways to enter, to entertain yourself. It's much more expensive to go to a football game than it is to go to a movie theater. Or it's even if mm -hmm. you want to go out to dinner, um, it gets pretty expensive. Whereas if you make a nice dinner at home with your uh, spouse or family, um, it tends to be much mm. more affordable and having an at home movie night, mm. there's still a lot of demand for content for yeah. anyone. So that's mm. a, that's not going to go away. Yeah. Um, I think Reed Hastings at Netflix said that their biggest competitor wasn't uh, Disney or um, Hulu. It was Fortnite. And that <laughs> that's where the biggest eyeballs are going now is towards like mobile games and uh, things at home. Uh, but personally, I don't think that's going to eat away. It's going to eat away some of our market share, 
uh, and our eyeball share, but I don't think it's going to eat us away entirely because there is still some level of community to uh, motion right. pictures. Right. That's an interesting way to look at the economics of, of what's what's more affordable for a family or a person to, to spend their time with. And uh, I hadn't thought about it like that, but that makes a lot of sense. That's good. Um, so do you do you have any experience working in the faith based space? Not a lot. Um, hmm. I know a lot of faith based buyers. Um, I don't actually yeah. make the content I sell mainly. Um, the stuff that I do at a more development stage is more with okay. people that I've worked with in the past mm -hmm. and still what they bring me. Um, and, uh, anytime you're even distributing a yeah, film, it's sure. a multi-year relationship you're getting into. Um, when you're talking about developing one, mm -hmm. that's, that can easily be a decade by the time you're done and you have to be really careful about right. who you yeah, no, for sure. get into bed with, so to speak. Um, so the, but on the faith-based market, I'm looking at a couple right now, um, primarily because I'm a, still a huge believer in, uh, mm -hmm. the community screening model. And I think it is, I think one of the best oh. uses for oh, it is with faith-based films. So explain, explain to the audience what that is. So a community screening model is essentially taking your film and screening it at pl at communal gathering places mm -hmm. that are not traditional theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, churches are one of the best places mm -hmm. that exist for mm -hmm. this um, because most churches tend to have pretty impressive multimedia systems right. these days and screening a film there is well within most of their capabilities. I mean, there was, uh, I sang a uh, hallelujah at my grandfather's funeral and they just needed me to bring a CD of the mm. instrumental track and right. it was all set up. And, um, that's, I don't think that's uncommon. That wasn't like a super right. media heavy right. church either. That was just one that happened yeah. to be in that town. Yeah. It's interesting. I, when, when I've uh, done some research on the history of Christian films, um, back in, you know, early back in the fifties and sixties, um, there were, uh, distributors who were sending, um, 16 millimeter projectors to all these churches for free, um, so that they would review and play films, uh, on 16 millimeter prints and they would ship them out. And so, yeah, that community uh, screening model has been around for some time. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a well-established model and the goal with it is less to make money directly, but more to grow the profile of the film so that you can make money through other avenues. That being said, and that's true for theatrical screenings as well. That being said, the community screenings, if it's well structured, if it's well structured, you can actually make uh, money for the filmmakers and the production team and distribution team, as well as act as something of a fundraiser for mm, the church itself. Yeah, that's true. So basically, everybody ends mm -hmm. up winning in a pretty mm. major fashion if it's well structured. So you said that you're aware of a lot of uh, buyers at film markets. Is that is that something that's growing? Mm, opposite. Yeah, uh, it's shrinking. Oh, so uh, specifically faith based buyers. Yeah, the yes. market is that that segment of the market is expanding. Oh. The overall film market scene that's not in a good place. Most of the buyers think it'll be dead within a couple of years. Really? Uh, so yeah. the American film market's going bye bye. I wouldn't say that. I'd say they're going to uh I, I'd say what it was uh pre two thousand eight recession, it will likely never be again. Huh. What it, where it's going now is uh they're really putting more emphasis on filmmaker services mm. and filmmaker education than they have in the past, to the point that many of the sales agents and distributors, which are the entire reason that uh, I went to it as well as any other uh, film distribution or sales professional went to it. Those parts are really declining, but the filmmaker services are growing and taking over a large part of oh. their revenue. But 
Um, so it's changing. By the way, uh, none of this is endorsed by <laughs> AFM. I do know most of their leadership team, but they have not oh, okay. said I can say any of this. Doesn't matter, but uh, yeah. So what what do you think is the reason for the faith um, the faith market being more involved in the in the uh, film buying market? It has a lot to do with the fact that niche platforms and niche markets are only recently getting any significant level of representation at any level of film market. Um, until pretty recently, most of these um, buyers were just buying on a territorial basis and trying to push it out widely um, since there wasn't really this micro-targeting ability that there is now. Um, these strong niches, like the faith-based market, are trend-setting in a way because there is such a – there's already an existing marketplace to push this content to, which is one of the right. biggest challenges for a distribution – for a distributor uh, to create. If there already is something, it becomes much easier. But um, – and but most niches still don't have a extremely well defined congregating place right um or community that you can actually reach without having um a chain of retail stores mm. that you have to build yourself mm. could it also be that um uh the the faith based market or the faith based film that are being made are generally uh, independent films, even when they go through Sony Affirm and Lionsgate and and those other studio sort of handoffs. Uh, it's still largely uh, an independent film movement. Do you think that plays into it? I'm sure it plays into it to some level. Um... I suppose for me, the term uh, independent film is somewhat, I, I think it means something different to me than it might mean to a lot of uh, filmmakers or people who watch films. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it What's means it mean any you? film without a student, without a direct studio backing or television station backing it. Um, and being directly involved mm -hmm. in the production. It's possible that you can have right. an independent film that is primarily financed via what's known as a pre-sale uh, to a television station, but so long as there isn't direct involvement in the script stage and in the production of the film itself, I would still classify that as independent. Um, and under mm. those relatively narrow guidelines, um, that would mean that only maybe 10% of the feature films made every year are not independent. Sorry, are, yeah. Mm. Um, just because the best data I've seen on it, and I'll grant that uh, is from a study that I authored with the help of Stage 32, uh, IndieWire, uh, Fandor and a few other partners several years ago is that around ten to twelve thousand independent or ten to twelve thousand feature films were made every year, mm -hmm. and only about only about at that time I think uh, seven hundred got theatrical releases um, yeah. and only really maybe 1200 to 1500 got uh any notable distribution hmm. um wow and the big so when i say uh independent film what i mean there is those 700 that got the notable theatrical releases were almost certainly not independent to right. start even at that okay time. Um, hmm. so yeah, I do think that, uh, there might be more independent work, uh, in the faith genre because they, they, they like to acquire things. And I know sometimes they, they may not be interested in picking up a film, but they will sort of shepherd the director and writer, uh, along to see how it evolves, you know, even though it's unofficial. Um, and then if it turns out into being something mm -hmm. that, 
is interesting to them, then they, they pick it up. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how you'd classify that. But in general, um, there aren't a whole lot in the faith-based uh, movement that uh, are being financed by the studios. I mean, we see the, the big tentpole ones that go out. I think that you see a lot more financial success on the independent level that we're talking about here than um, some of the major uh, tentpole Christian films that oh, come out. okay. Um, yeah. Like Noah. Was, oh, that's an Noah interesting point. Bad, didn't it? Or Noah's Ark, whatever it was, a couple like a year or so ago. Yeah, Noah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that one was. I don't know exactly how it did at the box office. Um, I didn't think to look it up before this, but mm. I I seem to remember it did not do well. Yeah. Um, I think it made its money back, but it didn't but do as good that, as they were hoping it would. Oh, okay. That 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 yeah. also makes sense. Um, the uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the last major breakout uh, that was – that you could argue was a large-scale movie would be right. uh, Passion. But even then, it wasn't really – that was an independent film. Uh, Mel Gibson largely yeah. financed yeah. that out of his own pocket. Um, and part of the reason for the success came down to the yeah. community screening model. Um, yeah. Then, even yeah, then. it was it was so, also yeah. a very um, controversial film in a, in a, I guess in a good way uh, that got a lot of attention uh, on it, and I think it was uh, one of the first, if not the first, um, uh, R-rated faith-based film uh, for the violence, and uh, it, it did remarkably well in spite of that rating. That does, yeah, that does make sense. Another thing to. Uh keep in mind is not anywhere near as many films get rated as I think people assume they do. On that. Hmm. Um, uh, you mean today? Today. Yeah. Um, even, yeah. even for like the past, it's probably gotten worse, but for the past uh, several years, I'd say it was true as well. Um, the I've, uh, as of this point, I think I've had, yeah, like right around 20 films that have been released. Not a single one is Oh, rated. really? That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a film on Showtime right now called Goodland, and that's got a TV yeah. rating on it, even though it had yeah. a theatrical run. Um, right. Because we never got it rated. Because it was it, it's expensive. I don't want to quote, right. because I don't want to say it wrong. Oh, okay. But it's more expensive than I think it is. Oh. To, uh, so do you on. see from a filmmaker standpoint uh, and from your standpoint as a distributor and financer, um, you know, rep, um, do you see a lot of difference in how um, a, a, a faith based filmmaker should approach their work and trying to get it uh, to the marketplace, finance into the marketplace? Or are they following basically the same pattern as all the other independent filmmakers uh, out there? I think that a lot of uh, faith-based filmmakers might be slightly ahead of the curve on this one because a lot of the filmmakers I talk to, thankfully much fewer recently, but a lot of the filmmakers I talk to still want, still think all they have to do is make a good film, get it into a yeah. festival, and then the rest will be taken care of for them. Yeah. That's yeah, false. sure. That's just flat out wrong. And good luck if you can even get into a festival. <laughs> if you can even get it into any of the big ones that matter. Yeah. Uh, most of the time you actually need to go directly to a programmer, which means you need to probably have had drinks with this programmer in the past. Um, if you want to get into like uh, Sundance or Tribeca or uh, the actual con festival as opposed to the market because they're very different. Mm. Uh, and when I say have drinks with, I mean actually have a relationship with. I don't necessarily mean you have to actually have drinks with, but there has to be some level of connection there more than I have your business card. The big advantage that faith-based filmmakers have is they've already got the way forward ingrained mm. into them. And the way forward for any creative of any kind, be it a motion picture uh, maker. And the reason I use motion picture is that 
the lines between feature film television and episodic are becoming more blurred especially as we move more towards mm-hmm. hybrid distribution models but it, um the best advice is to find a niche that you already exist in and truly understand and build a community around yourself within that niche and then once you've got that strong community around you you can then use that community to help right. spread of spread word of mouth about your work mm-hmm. outside of that core community <clears throat> and that's the whole idea behind doing community screenings here is to actually talk to the people who are ready and eager to hear your message and see your work and hopefully will very much appreciate it. Not with them being the end goal of your work. It's them to be the starting place so that if the community screening package goes ex- or ex- community screening plan goes very well yeah you might still go to theaters after that but the only reason you'll be able to afford to go to theaters is at that point you've got data that you can give to the theater owners that are likely in the same town as some of the churches you screened at so that they'll be able to drive people to actually buy tickets and you won't have to pay to rent the theater so what are some of the mistakes that um, – the big mistakes that indie filmmakers are, are making as they do this other than you know, thinking that everything's going to go swimmingly when they get into Sundance? Um, not understanding your end audience is a big thing. Um, you have to be thinking about who's going to watch your film from the time you start writing it. Okay. And uh, I'm not saying be pandering with that, but – you do have to make sure that you're being authentic Mm -hmm. to that audience Mm -hmm. and your audience is not everybody. It's just, (laughs) um, (laughs) yes, very true. (laughs) Um, so you have to understand who Mm -hmm. that is. And you also have to understand. And part of that is understanding what, your audience actually likes to watch and what they yeah. engage with. And particularly as it pertains to the faith-based market, um, like I've said, I'm not, I know a lot of faith-based buyers. I haven't directly worked on a uh, faith-based film as of this recording. I do have a couple of offers out on some, mm-hmm. but nothing's confirmed. Um The big thing that I can see there, and this is extrapolating from some other markets as well, in that I think a lot of the traditional buyers and the traditional channels that put out faith-based films have become a little too rooted in their own brand and uh, the own and the exact sort of content that they make, and they're leaving a lot of room Mm -hmm. for filmmakers to make atypical stories yes. uh, not that still provide the values and still have that redemption arc which is a lot of what most of the mm-hmm. buyers that i know are looking mm-hmm. for but it doesn't necessarily need to be as specific as an exact Bible right. story right yeah i agree with that that's one of the things i i've been talking to a lot of people about is that the the genre of the of christian film or faith-based um it's sort of micro sub sub genres of within a larger genre. And there's a lot of untapped um, stories and, and genres that could be um, developed that aren't being developed because there's no model for it. And I think we're still very much on the beginning curve of, of this, this genre defining itself and expanding to where it, it can really go. Um, and that's just because we're at the beginning stages and there's not a lot, there hasn't been a lot of interest um, uh, in it. And I was just talking to another uh, uh, marketer today who's in the faith-based area. And he was saying that, 
even if we had a hundred million dollars of uh, development money or fin- money to finance Christian films right off the bat, we don't have the base to benefit from such a fund at this point because we're not developed enough in order to take take that kind of, uh, of investment and make something of it. I think I get where you're coming from on that. Um, and there's a couple things I'd like to add to that. Um, first, when you're looking at establishing a new marketplace, it does help to look at historical precedent, even if they're only in related industries, not mm-hmm. necessarily the same industry. Yep. And it would, if I were trying to break into this, um, one of the first things I'd look to was the emergence of Christian rock and expansion yeah. of mm-hmm. uh, faith-based music from the more traditional hymnal style to uh, some of the more modern music. Yeah, um, That would be the first place I'd look because mm-hmm. film and music are very closely linked yeah. from a business sense. Yeah. That's a good point because there's a lot of people who who have done both, especially in the marketing, producing, financing, distribution. They've, they've worked both both sides of the uh, aisle on those uh, products. The other thing that I've just personally noticed, um, I do a lot. Uh, part of my business is con- is financial consulting, um, helping write business plans, do financial modeling, and a lot of things like that. Um, so. I've Mm -hmm. gone pretty far into a lot of relatively obscure um, movies and box office phenomenon. And one thing that I've noticed that Mm -hmm. continually Mm -hmm. comes up with successful uh, faith-based films is those that uh, tie into stories about veterans, uh, policemen, firemen, service people, um, yeah. just because there's such a mm-hmm. large crossover between those different communities there. And mm. it can help you break out of the traditional mold. Oh, so, I see. yeah, I, I think there was a Kirk Cameron movie a bit ago Fireproof. about a fireman. Fireproof. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. Um, that uh, is that is definitely a prime example of this. It is far from the only yeah. one, though. Um, so that is a uh, huh. so that's another thing to think about. There is while you definitely need to understand your core audience, you do need to understand uh, other demographics that your film might appeal to, and especially when you're dealing with a niche audience that is as large as the faith-based community, it helps to segment that even more to find the people who will really identify with your film. And that's why going with a subgenre of uh, veterans, I wouldn't say active, I wouldn't say military just because the military subgenre tends to mean like uh, actual military stories, like NCIS would be a straight military story. Um, as well as right, a lot of right. those sorts of movies, and I, and I don't think that part would play super well with a faith-based audience. Hmm, but interesting. The, uh, but like talking about veterans, policemen, firemen, um, there's probably a great, there's probably a lot of great stories about healthcare workers too. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that one of my faith-based buyers told me a while back, um. I don't want to name drop him because I haven't talked to him <laughs> about this at all. Um, uh, but uh, the stories really need some level yeah. of redemption to work. And ideally over in, not ideally, but they often also coincide with getting over yeah. some level of vice, like get, uh, coming to terms with alcoholism or loss or anything like that. But coming together is a huge part of what makes a faith-based movie Mm -hmm. uh, sellable. And this doesn't, yeah, I don't want to limit the themes on that too much, but I think that's greatly broadening them from what some people may think of this. 
that's very helpful to think about those crossovers. They would help you branch into the areas where you think potentially that um, uh, there hasn't been anything developed in this particular subgenre. Uh, but uh, yeah, good, good. Um, so if somebody was to come to you uh, with a film or a film idea, what stage do you want to get involved with them? Uh, so it depends a bit. Um, the simplest way of putting it is if you approach me at something with something that's super early stage, I do tend to charge some level of consulting fee. It's normally on a package basis. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, If you come to me with a completed film and I just need to broker it or help get it out there, I tend not to charge money up front for that. Mm -hmm. um, most of your audience, I think, are uh, filmmakers, so they understand that it takes a year or so to get the film made. Yeah. What they may not understand is once it's completed, like through color correction, through post, through like 100% completed, and you sign with a distributor, yeah. unless you're using a really... Uh, like if you're going the more traditional route and not using something like a community screening model, which should get you money faster just because of the nature of it, um, it often takes a year or more to get paid after mm. the final delivery. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so speaking of me as a consultant, I can't wait yeah. two to three years right. to get paid from the beginning of it. That just... It, it, right. I, I would not have a business. Um, the uh, So that's why yeah. I have to charge up front as a consultant for that. I do defer as much as I can, but mm. there is some level of upfront payment. And again, on the distribution and brokerage front, that's a different ball game. Um, those, if it is, if I'm just brokering it to buyers I know, um, or maybe doing a a community screening model or just distributing it myself, any of those, I tend not to charge up front. There will be some level of recoupable expenses I charge, mm -hmm. which is basically me just right. getting back sure. money that I put into the project. Where, where do you uh, prefer to so, see the yeah. film or the, the project when somebody brings something to you? If it's the first time I'm working with somebody, I tend to like to talk to them uh, towards completion. Mm. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's an issue of time yeah. more than anything. Um, the, if it's somebody who needs specifically needs help fleshing out a financial mix, uh, fleshing out a financing plan, writing a business plan, all of those sorts of things. I'm very happy to work with people on that. It's not something I write entirely myself because if you're not involved in writing the business plan, you tend not to understand yeah. it and that doesn't do anybody right, any right. good. But those sorts of analytics are things that I'll do on an upfront and I'm, I've been told that I'm very oh, affordable okay. on those rates for what, for what they are. It's not a yeah. cheap service, but compared to others who offer the same service right. I am. Okay, reasonable. cool. So what what is ex is there anything that's exciting to you as you look forward to the next few years of of, of this industry and where it's going? Yeah, um, in general, not not necessarily just as faith based, but you know, filmmaking in general, where we're going, where the industry is heading. Yeah, I really want to do more with community screenings. Personally, hmm. Um, hmm. I am. I've got this model and a playbook of which I only outlined the very basics of here that um, I'd love to put more to the test. Um, oh, interesting. And uh, that is a, I mean, we're recording this uh, right as COVID-19 is, is starting to get really bad or is already getting really bad. Yeah. Um, so it's not a good time to be doing that right this second now, but this will pass. Yeah. And I think it'll, but I think as it passes, it's going to do pretty substantial harm to indie movie theaters. Mm. And 
I think community screenings could be a way to help bring that element back. But um, I think in order to do that, it makes sense to flesh it out in a place where there's already proven success Mm -hmm. for the model um, before you start taking additional risks beyond that. So, so why don't you tell me a little bit about production next, what you're doing with that and how a, a independent filmmaker can utilize that. So the creed at uh, production next is you do the creative part and we do the rest. And huh. we mean that. Huh. Um, the platform is in its infancy right now. Um, it's really just getting its legs. Um, right now it's a fully, it's a fully functional project management system. We've had about five or six features shot through it and dozens of shorts. Um, and it does everything from budgeting, scheduling, uh, shot listing, crew management, cast management, uh, and all of that. But it's, but if it's just that, it's just a competitor to Studio Binder or Celtics. And that's yeah. not where we are. Uh, this is just the skeleton that we needed to build and the core product that needs to be there in order to do what we really want to do, which is take over more of these uh, parts of the process and parts of the industry that don't really have adequate access for filmmakers and not really good tools to help filmmakers make the projects that they that actually, to help support filmmakers in making the projects and not worrying about every little thing along the way. The goal has never been to simply be a project management system. It's already got a pretty robust community system and we've got an integration with Mandy where you can help find the crew you need for your project and plug them directly into our project management tools. We're talking about several other integrations mm. that I can't talk about there yet. But um, the big thing here is while right now it's just about the basics of project management. It's about becoming much more of an entire Hmm. Hmm. production company management system at every level. So from organization to um, handling finances and um, production schedules and that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's more of a hands-on approach. So they're, you're, you marrying, um, you know, uh, resources, personal resources into that as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that is an accurate thing to say. Um, I'm going to have to be more vague here than I'd like to be. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, the, uh, but uh, one thing that it does right now to give you a bit of an idea of our ethos on this is uh to the best of my knowledge, and by the way, I don't think anybody else does this. We let you uh, track your real world assets, like locations you have access to, all your equipment, props, wardrobe, the cast, your Rolodex of cast and crew members, directly in line with your project and detect conflict across multiple projects. Okay. So that uh, you can actually, so that instead of having to enter the same cast and crew or upload the same spreadsheet lots of times, it's in this section of the site. When you go to make a project, you can just put those people in those roles immediately. And if they've already got a production next account, have them join straight off. Oh, that's interesting. Your project. That's really interesting. Um, it, so we're taking that same basic sort of mindset towards other pieces of it. And like I said, there are pretty expansive community parts of the site already that enable you to ask questions of the community. Um, create groups uh, for your parts of the community. Um, We didn't talk about this before, but uh, we'd be happy to give you your own group, um, Todd. So uh, you can actually see what that's about. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, um, 
and actually just share resources, share updates, and find your community of filmmakers directly on the site and help each other to build a better film community. Oh, that's interesting. But And that's what it is mm. now. In the future, it's going to be the same basic sorts of uh, ideas and systems, but applied much mm. more broadly to some of the other mm -hmm. stuff we've been talking about on this. Uh, not specifically, not anything specifically we've talked about, but just in general, uh, the same sorts of parts of the filmmaking process that a lot of filmmakers don't think about, but helping make those tools and hmm. resources more accessible. And perhaps, you know, that you would have um, the resources for the various distribution models that you'd be putting a film through and being able to track all that. It's definitely something I'd like to do. Hmm. Cool. That sounds very exciting. I mean, I'm really interested to see what this, uh, that this turns out to be. I can tell you're sitting on some stuff that's that that could be potentially even more exciting, but uh, I will leave that <laughs> and see how what develops over the next year for that. that but that's great. Um, is there anything else that you had on your mind that would be relevant to um, the the faith based audience that that we haven't covered yet? That's on your mind. Um, for me, a lot of it just comes down to general mm -hmm. good business um speak to your audience make authentic content for your audience and uh perhaps most importantly l listen to what your audience thinks of your content no matter how painful <laughs> yeah. that is um, hence the need for good community screenings exactly um so that is yeah i think that's basically it so you have two books, The Gorilla Rep. Where can they find your book? The Gorilla Rep uh, is available most places. Um, you can also request it at uh, your public library. Oh. If uh, they may or may not have it, but it's available in places they can get it. Right. But other than that, it is most easily available on either Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. Okay. And where can they find you? The gorilla rep dot com is probably the easiest place. Um and also I'm kinda trying to expand my YouTube presence right now. It's still pretty mm -hmm. tiny. And production next? Production next is just productionnext.com. Um easy. Yeah, and it's uh free to join, by the way. Uh and yes. yeah. yeah, I joined it the other day when I found it, so Ben, thank you so much for being on this podcast. It's been very informative and uh um, so it sounds like you got a lot of cool stuff happening and uh, keep me posted on production next. Uh, and, you know, I'll put, I'll put some links up on our website for, for all these things for folks to find you. So thank you so much for your time and, and, and wisdom. No problem. You'll find links to Ben's many efforts in the show notes, including his company, Gorilla Rep Media, Production Next, and his two books, The Gorilla Rep and The Entrepreneurial Producer. If you're just launching a film or beginning to shop around a completed film, Ben can help you navigate the treacherous waters of an ever-changing industry. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. For more information about the Ministry of Motion Pictures, you can find us at ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life? Echoes in eternity.